Hi, and welcome back to Blockchain Fundamentals with Bill Laboon. Today, we're going to discuss some blockchain applications. So basically, things that you can do with blockchain besides just the uh, you know, putting hashes and exchanging currency, but what sort of real-world applications uh, can, can you do with, with blockchain? So a lot of what we've discussed already has been very related to moving currency around and the challenges of doing that or you know, keeping a store of value, maintaining um, the security of the network, uh, or it's been really theoretical, things that you know, possibly can be done. But what I want to discuss today is some of the history of what people have actually been doing with blockchains uh, and what could be done in the future. So we see really a sort of, I think, a Cambrian explosion of applications in the blockchain space really over the last few years. I, if we look at, through time, we sort of see the, the first few years of blockchain, people were really figuring out what it uh, could be used for. Uh, and after that, people tried some uh, uh, so some more interesting things. And now I think people in, in general in the space are sort of seeing, you know, what are the positives and negatives? And we have a bit of an ecosystem that people can build upon already. Uh, and when I say this, I mean specifically, when I say an ecosystem, I mean specifically uh, tools that can be used, development tools, but also the, the, the broader ecosystem of other you know, experiments that people can build on and see what has worked, what has not, what's been useful, etc. So one of the first things that blockchain was used for besides uh, uh, si simple uh, uh, store of, of you know, value transfer was gambling. Uh, but it turns out you know, ran true randomness uh, on a blockchain is difficult. And really for gambling, you want to have as, as much as possible true randomness, or at least you don't want people on the system to be able to pre-calculate what is going to happen. However, computers cannot actually generate random numbers. And when I say this, I have a particular technical definition of, of random. Uh, so when you see your random numbers on a computer, they are generally deterministically generated. So uh, this, these are called pseudo-random numbers. And with a blockchain, since you must always be able to calculate out and verify the blockchain, uh, it becomes especially difficult uh, to, uh, to, to use any sort of you know, a randomness source. Okay, so anything, you know, you'll see uh, some computers, if they're trying to get randomness, they may look at the, the temperature of the um, of the, the the CPU and the length of time between mouse clicks and keyboard clicks, etc. But that's not really something you can do on a blockchain because it can't really be uh, uh, calculated ahead of time, and it certainly can't be verified. So, what we usually end up doing is something like you know, the, the, the block hash. This is generally difficult to know ahead of time, especially when generating uh, blocks is, is difficult. Um, now, there are you know, some other, there are a lot of you know, issues in do, of doing this with uh, uh, you know, like non-proof of work chains where uh, you know, a, a block producer might know ahead of time where they're, uh, when they're going to produce. Um, but from, from a, or even from a proof of work, sense where it might be you know, extremely difficult to determine uh, what is going to be, for instance, the block hash of the, of the next block. And we saw this, remember, with uh, Vitalik and his proof of life showing that he knew the block hash of a particular block and thus was alive. Um, you know, even with proof of work, which you would think would have the most sort of semi-randomness available, uh, it, there, you can cheat the system. And if there are large enough rewards, it actually makes sense to do so. So probably uh, the easiest one to understand here, and we could really get into depth uh, on the different ways to, to cheat uh, these systems, uh, is just by thinking of miners being able to withhold blocks. Uh, so if you remember block withholding attacks in terms of mining pools, this is very similar. 
So let's say uh, miner A uh, makes a bet uh, that the next block hash is going to be even. Okay? Uh, and miner A has a large percentage of the hash power on the network. So miner A generates a block, but it has an odd block hash. So the miner throws it away, does not broadcast it to the network. It's as though uh, the block never existed. So uh, then the miner mines another block that does have an e that has an even block hash and adds that to the canonical blockchain. So what have they done here? By being able to you know, withhold this block, they were able to wait until they found a block with an even hash. Of course, doing this uh, is going to be, uh, you know, is going to cost money, right? Or it's going to cost resources, at least. You know, generating blocks in a proof of work chain is difficult. And, of course, there is also risk. This is not a way uh, to, to free money. So let's say miner A mines this block with the odd block hash and throws it away. Well, what are they giving up by doing this? They're giving away the block rewards. Uh, so you may think, well, as long as they make more money on their bet, then it makes sense to do this. But depending on how much hash power you know, miner A has, there may, there's probably a very good chance that miner B, some other miner, is going to come around and broadcast the block which means miner A did a lot of work to generate that block that never goes onto the canonical blockchain. So miner A lost out on the block rewards. And there's still just a, a basically a 50-50 chance of whether that block hash is going to be even or not, uh, the one that's generated by miner B. So we can see here uh, block hash, uh, you know, they did generate an even, uh, so perhaps you know, uh, minor A would it all worked out for minor A, but there just as likely could have been uh, an odd hash, right? It could have been B21, uh, in which case they would not have gotten the rewards. In which case, not only would they have lost out on the rewards, but they also would uh, have lost out uh, on the bet. So there's risk in, in all of these, right? Uh, all of these uh, trying to, to fool the system. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is an attack that you should be, uh, 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 know about. It's something, you know, anytime you try to think that, well, I can just trust that there's going to be randomness in a computational system, uh, anytime, not just in blockchain, then you should be very, very wary. That being said, there are plenty of gambling applications uh, that have been out there. One of the first non, uh, uh, you know, just holding currency applications of the Bitcoin network was Satoshi Dice, which just like uh, our example here, allows you to gamble on whether the hash of the next block would be even or odd. Um, uh, interestingly, this was uh, sold by creator Eric Voorhees uh, for about 126,000 Bitcoins, 126,315, uh, which is worth about $11 million dollars at, at the time. This is one of the first big you know, Bitcoin businesses. Uh, Eric Voorhees went on uh, to be the founder of, of Shapeshift and uh, is a very famous uh, member of the, the, the Bitcoin and, and blockchain community. So based on you know, these small um, uh, is a, a, you know, a small uh, occurrence, small, small applications, uh, people started to think about smart contracts. Now, smart contracts, the, the concept of them actually uh, goes back quite a while uh, uh, into the, 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 the late 90s with uh, Nick, Nick Szabo. Uh, but uh, they really did not start actually being used until... Um, uh, uh, you know, really like, you know, like the modern blockchain era. But the idea of a smart contract is code uh, that can run directly on the blockchain. Right? So what we mean by this, it's code, and an end user can program them, add the contract to the chain, and then users can examine that code. They'll know what exactly that code is going to do because anyone can examine it. They can see the state of the entire system. Um, and there's no way to cheat. So for instance, if I were a... Uh, a, a scammer. I could set up a, a bank, right? That uh, just you know an online bank 
and I say, all right, if you give me your money, I will give you 50% returns, let's say. Um, and there's no way for you to tell when you send the money in um, that I, my code, you, you don't know what my code is. You don't know how my bank runs. You don't know if I'm just sending it into my own account. I don't know, you know, where am I getting uh, these returns? But with a smart contract, anyone can look and see what the code actually does. And this allows us to make trustless applications, trustless distributed, almost unstoppable applications. Since you know, they're running directly on the blockchain, they stay on the blockchain, blockchains are immutable, and anyone can verify, they can look at the code, they can see what happens. Uh, now, there always is a chance of, of bugs or simply like you know, underhanded coding practices, but that's a lot easier to verify than uh, just code that's hiding on a server somewhere that nobody can see and nobody knows how it's run. Even an open source application, you don't have a guarantee that the code that they're showing you in their repository is actually what's running on the site. But with smart contracts, you can. You can see all, uh, uh, see all of that. And these contracts can be self-executing. So they're, they're code, right? They're, they're a program that you can run. They run on the blockchain trustlessly and immutably. So something that people have talked about uh, using this for for quite a bit, and we see a few different applications out there like Augur that do it, are prediction markets. So this allows you to bet that events will occur in the future. So you can have like simple betting on, on sports events, for instance, or uh, political elections or actions that something will take place, uh, that the weather will be sunny or rainy tomorrow, or that the temperature will be above 20 degrees, or you know, whatever. Any event that someone is willing to take the other side uh, for what you say, we can make a, a market for it. Of course, uh, prediction markets are very dependent on outside, you know, external to the blockchain data. Uh, and so we have the Oracle problem, which we've discussed in the past, you know, getting information from outside the blockchain uh, onto the blockchain in a trusted way is, is very difficult. Um, and it may seem at first glance like prediction markets, they're just sort of a fancy way of betting, but they actually have a lot of interesting implications. Uh, so for, for one, they give data to researchers. Uh, so the Iowa electronic markets uh, were used, uh, set up uh, by researchers to see how prediction markets could be used to predict events. You know, so for instance, if you have a, um, a market to predict whether a, uh, you know, a, I don't know, if, if a, uh, a earthquake is going to occur, you know, in a particular place. Well, we can imagine that, you know, if you were using your own money to bet on this, that you have, you know, some particular knowledge on it, perhaps you're, you know, a seismologist, uh, or you have a new way to predict earthquakes. And this might be very interesting to know. We can look at, at markets and see, you know, does, does uh, the price rise? Do they offer any, before an earthquake, do they offer any predictive power? Um, it could be used as a sort of insurance, right? So let's say you want to, you, you own a vineyard, okay? And you make a bet that uh, the weather will go below freezing sometime in the next in the growing season. So during the growing season, uh, let's say you, you know the type of grapes you grow should not freeze or you know they're, they're bad and you can't make your wine. So you might spend a thousand dollars to bet that there will be. Uh, uh, a, a frost between May and September. And if there is, you know, let's say it's paying off 10 to one because it's rare for these frosts to occur. Well, you get $10,000 back. However, your, uh, your vineyard is ruined. It, but at least you have $10,000. You have enough to live on for, for the season, even though you can't produce any wine this year because of the, the early frost. Well, this is like you know, a form of insurance. You're paying $1,000 in order to get $10,000 back if this event occurs. And you can think of that as like your premium, right? Your, th your thousand and your 10,000, if, you, uh, if, the, if the event occurs, then you will get some, uh, you know, some extra money, which will um, you know, sort of mitigate uh, the action uh, that it caused. Or say you, uh, there, there's a politician who, has, uh, who is up for election, 
and they have been railing against your particular industry. Well, maybe you will bet that uh, they, they will win the election. And if they do, yes, your livelihood might be hurt. But on the other hand, you've hedged that risk because you will get uh, some, uh, some reward uh, from it, right? They, by winning the bet. So prediction markets can be uh, you know, very useful aside from uh, you know, sim simple uh, just, you know, betting on events or gambling. Uh, however, having this on you know, a decentralized, distributed, uh, immutable system can cause problems. And one uh, particular kind of market uh, that people have, have postulated is assassination markets. So what if you could bet that people would die by or on a certain date? Well, here's, there's a problem with this, right? If I want per some person dead then I could say, I'm going to bet some huge amount of money, $5 million, uh, that person X will be alive on this date. And you can put down, you know, whoever is the, uh, the, the, the X turn, the other person, you know, if you bet $1 and then uh, you get $5 million back uh, if, if, if this person dies, or if this, if this person dies by that date. Well, now... Person Y, so some other person that person X does not know at all, uh, could then take the other side of that bet and put into place some actions which would lead to the death of person X. Then, uh, excuse me, the, the, the death of, yeah, the death, death of, of, of person X. So then the original person, entirely anonymously, has just you know, posted a huge bond uh, that someone would die that person dies, that bond is paid out, right? Because they, they, they lost the bet. They were hoping to lose the bet. They were putting the, um, uh, you know, put, they, they put that out there because they expected it to happen. Um, so this is you know, a way of anonymously funding assassinations, which uh, seems you know, maybe perhaps uh, suboptimal from a societal point of view. Uh, however, you know, there are actually, interestingly, some people who say that it would make society safer because if you're always at risk of anonymous assassins, well, you're going to behave better. Uh, I, I won't argue uh, that, that point either way, um, but what we have seen is that they've already occurred. So we have seen, uh, we don't know how serious they are, but there have been... Um, uh, assassination markets pop up on some uh, distributed prediction markets. Of course, you know, there are always uh, other ways to pay off assassins, but uh, this is one you even could do it with a sort of uh, you know, plausible deniability by saying, I just, you know, I thought this person uh, was going to stay alive for, for much longer. And that's why I bet that much. Again, I'm not a lawyer. But uh, this is an interesting aspect of decentralized prediction markets that, that has uh, emerged and people should be aware of. So some other uh, cool uh, things that are occurring. Um, so the Brave browser uh, allows you from you know, viewing responsible ads by viewing uh, ads uh, on their browser uh, or simply buying these bats, Brave attention tokens. Um, by viewing the ads, you can get these bats. Right? So these tokens, the blockchain tokens uh, that, that you get, and then you can give these bats through the browser to sites that you like for your micropayments or subscriptions or, or just a tip to say that you like what they're doing. So uh, you know, we, we can see here uh, these you know, micropayments has been something that people have been discussing about how to do for, for decades uh, at this point, and uh, Brave is actually uh, seeing some uh, adoption uh, of it. MetaMask allows you to access distributed applications or dApps uh, via your web browser. Uh, so if you've used uh, some uh, older um, uh, like uh, node software uh, or things, things like Mist, uh, now you can just access, uh, you know, interact with uh, these distributed applications through, uh, through your browser instead of uh, you know, typing in a bunch of uh, commands at the, at the, at the command line. One of these dApps uh, is CryptoKitties. So CryptoKitties was very famous. Uh, it was one of the earliest uh, non-fungible tokens. So tokens that uh, are attached to a specific um, you know, card or code or you know, that are not interchangeable uh, with one another. 
Uh, and CryptoKitties will allow you to make uh, kitties on the blockchain, so cats on the blockchain. Um, and anyone, again, can look at the code. Uh, I have the, uh, the link to the code down there. And you can buy cats off people and verify that you own them and use, uh, using a genetic algorithm, make more crypto kitties by having them breed with each other. Uh, so there have been you know, other uh, of these you know, sort of collectible games, uh, as well as other kinds of games on, on the blockchain. But uh, crypto kitties is very famous because it was you know, so popular, it really brought the Ethereum network uh, to, to a crawl and brought gas prices really high uh, when, it, when it came out because so many people wanted to breed their kitties. And since breeding a kitty and owning a kitty are both, uh, uh, you know, like smart contract calls and there's only a finite amount of space in blocks, uh, these you know, blocks were getting very full of uh, kitty-related uh, uh, actions. So one of the uh, uh, hot buzzwords as of uh, 2020 when I'm filming these lectures is DeFi or decentralized finance. So this allows you to do financial transactions that normally require some sort of centralized entity like a bank. So in, you know, in comparison to CFI, centralized finance, this is DeFi, decentralized finance uh, occurring on the blockchain. So some simple, we'll start with some simple ones and then go into more uh, complex uh, things that you can do uh, with, with DeFi. So one of the simplest things is crypto collateralized loans. So here you're going to provide some crypto, so some Bitcoin or Ether or whatever as collateral uh, to, uh, to perhaps you know, some other user or to a smart contract itself. Then you'll borrow against it. So you know, if you, you lock up uh, whatever, 50 ETH, and you get 10 ETH back, and you have to pay you know, one ETH uh, every day back to the smart contract for 11 days, or you know, every so many blocks or whatever. So just like a traditional loan, except it has collateral. Uh, think of it like a mortgage. So if you don't pay, you know, if repayment doesn't occur, if you uh, forget to, to, to send money back, then you could forfeit your deposit. Uh, so this way you can you know, maintain you know, your, your ETH if you think that you're going to have more in the future and you know, pay back uh, or your Bitcoin or whatever uh, while you know, bar you're borrowing against it. So just like you can borrow against your house or borrow against your car for a loan, these crypto collateralized loans allow you to borrow against your crypto in a decentralized way. One of the early arguments against Bitcoin was its volatile nature, that the price of a Bitcoin could uh, change dramatically uh, over very short periods of time. And so one of the, some of the solutions that people came up with were to try to maintain some sort of peg uh, to if one coin is equal to a dollar or a franc or an ounce of gold or, or whatever. Um, so there are a lot of centralized entities uh, that do this. But there are some places that use algorithms to do it in a decentralized way. So an instance uh, is, is Maker. So MakerDAO allows you to deposit a certain amount of Ether. And this gives you the right to mint DAI. And DAI, uh, via the algorithm, are going to try to stay very close to uh, $1 each. Okay? And uh, can be, and, but if the, the price of Ether which is determined via oracles, so remember we've got the whole oracle problem, drops too much, your stake can be liquidated. But on the plus side, you always have the die that you borrowed uh, against it. So it is a way, uh, you know, by using, if you're just using die, these die can be sent, you can use them and spend them wherever. Uh, you, know, you can use these and take advantage of them while others ha uh, take on the risk, the volatility risk. The people that have the uh, uh, that you know, that have that have uh, locked their ether here, so they're taking a risk. Both they're taking a risk to the downside uh, and you know uh, uh, potentially the upside if they're locked, since they're going to have um, uh, you know if they're they have gotten die uh, out of it, then they uh, you know, could. Start over there. Sorry. <laughs> if uh, so, they have a risk, right? And then if the price goes down, they could get uh, uh, wiped out. Uh, on the other hand, they could also ramp up their um, 
uh, ramp up their uh, uh, volatility by using that die to buy more ether. So like they mint some die and use that to buy more ether. Maybe they lock that ether up and mint die from that, uh, which allows you uh, sort of a, a way of, you know, like multiplying, leveraging your investment. So it's a, uh, an algorithmic way to leverage your investment. And of course, uh, what would any financial system be without Ponzi schemes? Uh, so one of the more famous ones and bigger uh, ones was uh, FOMO 3D, uh, where FOMO is fear of missing out. And the, the basic idea here is a time where it goes down to zero. I mean, this is based on blocks. So you have, to, you have to pay some small amount of ether, which is then added to, to the pot, and the timer goes up a little bit. So uh, you know, really what, what you're doing is as time goes on, um, you know, the, the timer is constantly going down and people are putting in a little bit of ether uh, to, to, keep it, uh, to keep it from hitting zero. Because as soon as it hits zero, the last person um, uh, gets the, uh, gets the pot. So it's kind of a, uh, a clever, uh, clever thing. And it went on for quite a while. The winner ended up, the first winner won $3 million worth of ether, uh, using a rather clever strategy of buying out all the space by, by, by very high gas prices for many blocks in a row so that the timer, uh, would go down. Uh, so this had the, the, the famous URL exit scam me, which I've always found amusing that they really just sort of admitted up front that it's, that it's a scam. And, you know, again, still $3 million worth of ether uh, was put into it. Uh, exchanges. So there are a lot of ways to exchange one token for another. Uh, Ethereum has the ERC-20 uh, standard, which allow uh, you to create your own tokens that are interoperable uh, 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 with each other using the same interface. So these are basically overlay currencies, which we discussed already. Uh, and IDEX uh, is a, a market which will let you uh, trade, uh, again, without a middleman. It's, it's running a smart contract on the, on the chain. Um, you can issue uh, uh, bids and make offers uh, for people uh, if you want to trade you know, token A for token B. Uh, even more interesting are these exchanges that use automated market me maker mechanisms. Uh, so these don't have buy or sell orders, but rather you know, there are a variety of ways to do this. Uh, but I'm going to talk specifically about, uh, you know, to make these AMMs. There are a variety of ways to make them. But I want to talk about the liquidity pools that Uniswap uh, uses. So here, prices are automatically adjusted to keep the levels even. So here, let's say we have you know, 5 million of token A and 5 million of token B. And... The, the system is always trying to make things uh, even. So here, for instance, if someone wants to trade token A for token B, it's going to be basically a one-to-one -one swap uh, because we have the same amount of token A and token B. Uh, however, uh, if token B, there's too many token B here, we can imagine this as token B being cheaper, right? There's more of them available. We always think of the two tokens in, in the pool as having equivalent their, their total value together is, is equivalent. Uh, so here would be like a three for one swap if I wanted uh, to get some token A's with my token B's. Um, the, the cool thing about this is that you really can never run out of liquidity. Things just get more and more expensive. So you can imagine a 10 to one swap, a 100 to one swap, a 1,000 to one swap, uh, but uh, that, that last token A that will, will be in there, last like portion of token A, will cost an infinite amount of money to get the last tiny little bit. Uh, so as, as, this gets, as this gets bigger, uh, we have more, you know, it gets more and more expensive uh, uh, to purchase. So it's sort of, at that point, you know, arbitragers will come in and say, all right, well, I'm gonna buy some, you know, if token B's gotten too cheap, so I'm gonna buy some of those, uh, you know, I'll pass some in. Uh, you provide more liquidity. So it's a really interesting uh, concept uh, that has a lot of um, uh, uh, angles uh, to it that I, I recommend you look into. It's, it's a very uh, interesting uh, concept and really uh, is very different from sort of traditional bid offer uh, markets. So there's a lot of other interesting stuff out there that I don't 
uh, want to spend uh, too much time on. So there's yield farming where people like provide liquidity to places uh, and uh, try to, to get yield, like try to gain more tokens. There are flash loans where you can actually get loan something, you know, like uh, in a single block without collateral. And the reason you can do this is because if you've got one transaction in a block in like Ethereum, it either fails or it doesn't fail, right? Or you know, I guess succeeds or it doesn't succeed. And if it doesn't succeed, well, that loan never takes place, right? If you don't pay it back. Uh, but if you do, then, well, you can just pay you know, a very small amount be uh, because if the collateral isn't at risk, if, if the loan amount isn't really at risk because you won't, the, the transaction will fail if the, the, uh, the provider doesn't get it back, well, you know, uh, that's, that's very cheap. I can make that very cheaply if my money, I can make loans very cheaply if my money isn't at risk. Uh, so flash loans, very, very interesting concept where you can borrow amount of money for, for instantaneously, really, in the space of one block. Uh, there's DAOs, uh, so distributed autonomous organizations and other on-chain governance. So you can actually like, you know, vote on what you want an organization to do by buying tokens. And uh, so finally, there's like a, a term that I've heard uh, uh, bandied about, so money Legos that we can think about you know, all of these different things you can do, like flash loans and DAOs and yield farming and adding liquidity pools and trading and loans as, as a programmable and interfaceable way, uh, uh, things, right? So just like Legos, you can put them together in all sorts of ways and make you know, more complicated, um, uh, uh, you know, whatever Lego creations are called, toys or whatever. Uh, similarly, you can, uh, you know, make really complicated things here where you, you know, uh, do a flash loan to call some on, uh, to get, you know, buy some tokens and use them for governance and make a, uh, 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 make, a make a loan to purchase a crypto kitty that then sell that crypto kitty to someone else to arbitrage it. Uh, you know, think of it like programming where in the old days you had to say specifically, you know, what particular assembly code instructions you're going to use. But now, uh, I don't have to do that. I can just call you know, square root of four or you know, display this on the screen. I don't need to worry about all the ones and zeros behind it. So similarly, what we're seeing with this, because they have, uh, they're programmable and they have you know, um, standardized interfaces, we actually can combine a lot of these applications together, not just in finance, but in all sorts of other uh, fields to do very interesting and more complicated stuff. So just like you know, the history of computing, in some sense, is the history of abstracting further and further away uh, from you know, the bare metal, from the actual CPU, uh, what we're seeing with blockchain applications, we're actually getting further and further away uh, from you know, having to deal with you know, individual hashes and you know, cryptographic primitives, but rather, you know, what can we do uh, with these applications that are running uh, immutably and unstoppably.